Now that we know a little bit more about residuals, we can understand why residuals help us determine what is the best line for our data. Our linear regression model is known as the least squares regression line because it is the line whose sum of all the squared residuals is the least compared to any other line. In formula, that would look like this. We see that sigma, that's our mathematical symbol for the sum, and we see any individual residual, again, that's the y minus the y hat squared. If we sum up all of the squared residual values, well, we're going to get a number, but we want that sum of the residual squared to be the smallest compared to any other line. That's going to produce the actual best line. Now, why does this make complete sense? To understand that, we can actually take a look at what's called a residual plot. Now that you know what a linear regression model is and what a least squares linear regression model is and why it's truly the best line, the big question is, how do I find this equation? Most kids don't even worry about why it's the best line. They just want the equation given to them. So how do we produce this equation? Y hat equals A plus B X. We'll actually have several different options. One, we actually have some formulas that can be used to actually create the formula. The formulas do require a lot of information though. We have to have all of our X data. We have to find the mean of our X data and the standard deviation of our X data. Then we have to have all of our Y data. We have to have the mean of all the Y data and the standard deviation of all the Y data, as well as do we need the correlation between the X's and the Y's. So to find the y-intercept and to find the slope, we have the following formulas. To find the slope, we take the correlation r times the standard deviation of y divided by the standard deviation of x. And then to find the corresponding y-intercept, we need to take the average y minus the slope that we have to find first times the average x. Now, if I or your teacher or the AP test is ever going to ask you to use these formulas, they will give you all the information you need to utilize them. You just have to know how to use them, but they're also given to you on the formula sheet for the AP stats exam as well. So it's pretty simple to use these formulas. But I'll be honest, in most situations, the AP test or your teacher will just give you the linear regression model for you to use free of charge. Or another thing they could do is use what's called a computer regression output model. Think of this as just a way that they could provide you all the information you need to know in order to generate the equation. The least squares regression line has many facts about it that you need to know. The first is the y-intercept. This is the a value. The y-intercept is what we predict the response variable to be when the explanatory variable is zero. Again, it's a y-intercept. That should make sense algebraically. When x equals zero, what do we predict the response variable y to be? Sometimes this value actually makes sense in context of the problem. Sometimes it does not, and that's okay. Next up is the slope, and this is the B value. Proper interpretation of the slope hinders upon you understanding that the slope determines how much we predict the response variable to change for every increase of one unit of the explanatory variable. I like to look at the slope as a fraction. You could turn any number into a fraction by putting it over one. So if you take the slope B and you put it over one, the slope on top is the change of y, the response variable, the one in the denominator is the change in x. So the slope tells us for every one increase of the x variable, what we predict the change of the y variable to be. Another super important value is the coefficient of determination. Pretty cool name, coefficient of determination. This is literally taking correlation r and simply squaring it not too hard to find. Correlation squared. Now, what R squared or the coefficient of determination tells us is actually super important. It tells us how well these two variables are connected. So it actually gets turned into a percentage. So typically when we have R and we squared, we're going to get a decimal, move that decimal point two places to turn it into a percentage. And the R squared value tells us the percent of variation in the response variable that is actually explained by the variation in the explanatory variable through the regression model. So I know it's kind of confusing to understand and most kids just kind of remember like a script, they just write that out. But the idea is this, we have a bunch of different response values, right? A bunch of different Y values and then they, they vary because they're different. But the R squared value tells us what percent of that variation in the response variables is actually because of the different values for the corresponding x values. So think of it as how strong these values are tied. 
obviously the best you can be is 100%. That means 100% of the variation in Y is actually because of the variation in X. But the closer to 100%, the good, right? So 90, 95% is great values. But really R squared helps us understand how reliable our linear regression model is. Because the more connected the two variables are, the more reliable our predictions are going to be. If your coefficient of determination is only like 40%, that shows that they're not that strongly connected. Hence, any prediction about the response from the exploratory variable is not going to be as reliable as if it was, say, 99%. The last major value that is needed and asked about is called S, the standard deviation of the residuals. Again, it can be a little bit of confusing value to understand, but just think of it as this. It is the standard deviation of your residual values. But what it tells us is actually way more important than just knowing what it is. It tells us that when we use our linear regression model to make predictions for Y, how typically off those predictions are. So it's basically like an, uh, an average of your error. Like say, hey, listen, hey, when you use this model, it's never going to be perfect. It's, you know, no predicted value is going to match the actual value perfectly, right? It might be really close, but to be perfect is going to be very rare there's typically going to be some error, some distance between what is actual and what is predicted for any point. So the standard deviation of the residuals is basically telling you what's the average distance that an actual value is for the predicted value, showing you that when you use your line, how much you're typically off by. Now here you really have to take context into account. So for example, if you're trying to predict the weight of an elephant, right? and your standard deviation of the residuals is five pounds. Well, that's actually really, really good. That means that when you're trying to predict the weight of an elephant, you're typically off by five pounds when you use your least squares regression line. And when you're trying to predict of an animal that weighs tons and tons, that being off by five pounds is really good, reliable predictions. But if you're trying to predict the weight of a rabbit and your standard deviation is five, same deviation of your residuals, that is, well, that means you're actually way off because rabbits don't weigh a whole lot. And if you're basically saying, hey, I'm predicting the weight of rabbits, and I'm usually only off by about five pounds, well, that's being off by a lot. So you have to make sure that obviously understand that smaller S's are better because that means that typically your actual values are closer to your predicted values, which means you have a very reliable model. But again, you also have to take into account context because five might be small when you're talking about elephants, but five pounds is certainly not small when you're talking about rabbits. But S is a really cool number that really helps us understand how reliable and how good our line is at making those predictions. Now, we have learned quite a bit of information, and when you're working with the least squares regression model, there is a lot that goes into it. But here's the best part. On the AP exam and hopefully on your unit exam in class, you really are meant to focus on the interpretation of that information. So typically all the information given to you in what is called a computer output regression analysis. I know it's kind of confusing, but imagine you have a computer and you dump all of your explanatory variables and all of your response variables into that computer and beep, boop, 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 beep, beep, it spits out to you everything you need to know in a nice table called a re computer regression output table. So here's an example of that for our house problem. When we're taking the size of the house in square feet, we're trying to predict the price of the house in thousands of dollars. This is an example where, again, everything is going to be given to you. So we see a scatter plot, so we could take a look at the overall description of what's going on with our data. We see a residual plot that tells us that our line is a pretty good line, but we also see this computer output table that has in it the slope, the y-intercept, s, and r-squared, all the key things that you need to be able to find, use, and interpret. Now, we also see some other numbers in this table. We see um, SE, stands for standard error, we see a T stat and a P value. Those are all gonna be used way later back in unit nine. So for right now, you could basically ignore all of those values. Now, in an ultimate problem, you're going to be given all the information you need and ask things like, hey, find the slope and interpret it, find the y-intercept and interpret it, tell me what R squared tells you and tell me what S tells you. And you can do all of that with one of these computer output tables. All you need to know is what to say and how to say it. And hopefully I've explained that well in this video. Now let's pretend for a second that we were given all of this information together for our house problem. The scatter plot, the residual plot, and the computer regression model. And we could be said, you know, we could be asked, you know, a bunch of different questions. So here it all is. So first we see the scatter plot that tells us that it's positive, linear, pretty strong. And we see that the 
bigger the house, the higher the price. In the residual plot, we see nothing, no pattern whatsoever. Again, that's a good thing. It means that our line does a great job of going through the data, producing positive and negative residuals throughout. Now, with the computer output table, we see everything we need. And that very first column, it goes in alphabetical order A and then B. So our y-intercept is 74.3534. Now, what's the interpretation of that? Well, when a house has zero square feet, we predict the price to be about $74,000. Now, wait a minute. Just as I mentioned earlier, sometimes the y-intercept doesn't make sense in context, and this would certainly be an example of that. Well, that's extrapolation. Remember, the, you know, our houses started around 800 square feet, so try to make a prediction for zero square feet wouldn't make sense. And if a house had zero square feet, then it really wouldn't be a house, would it? But that doesn't matter. The interpretation is what it is based on the value. Now, the slope is 0.1061, and of course, we could be asked to interpret what that slope means. Remember, make it a fraction. Put it over top of 1, 0.0161 over 1. This tells me for every one square foot that a house is bigger than another house, we would predict the price to increase by 0.1061 thousands of dollars. Now, I realize that that's a weird interpretation because it's in thousands, but basically when you're in thousands, you want to convert, you got to move the decimal three times. So that would be about $106. So for every one square foot that a house gets bigger, we would predict the price of that house to increase by about $106. Next up, we have the R squared. Remember, we typically turn R squared into a percentage. So it's about 87%. That tells us that 87% of the variation in price of a house is actually explained by the variation in the size of the house. That's a pretty strong connection. 87% shows that these two variables are certainly related, but obviously a lot of other factors besides the size of a house goes into the price of a house. Next up, we have the S, that is the standard deviation of the residuals. Here we see it's about $13,000. If you want to be more specific, you could actually move that decimal three times and be $13,345. So what that tells is that when we use this linear regression line, to try to predict the price of a house based on its size, we're typically off by about $13,000. If you're trying to predict the price of a house and you're only off by $13,000, I think you're actually doing pretty good. In this data, houses were very expensive, ranging from 100 all the way up to almost $900,000. So for houses well over $100,000 and you're trying to predict the price of them and you're typically only off by $13,000, I think you're doing pretty good. So all of this can come together, and this is what's usually going to be presented to you in an AP stats type of problem, where you're going to be asked to identify these values and make sure you know how to interpret them. Here's another example, and this might be a good time for you to listen to the example, but then hit pause and try to identify the intercept, the slope, R squared, and S, and interpret what they mean. Here's the scatter plot of IQ scores versus the time it takes to complete an online dissection in minutes. So here's a computer regression analysis of all of this scatter plot. So again, typical questions could be, what is the intercept and interpret what it means? The intercept is 93.759. That is, if you have an IQ of zero, we were predicted it to take 93 minutes for you to complete the on-site online dissection. Now, again, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because uh, zero IQ would be really, really, really low. I don't think if anybody has an IQ of zero, but again, it's probably because of extrapolation. It doesn't mean the intercept is wrong. It just means it doesn't have a lot of meaning in context. That typically happens with the y-intercept. Now, what about the slope? The slope is negative 0.635. And well, that tells us that for every one point that a person's IQ goes up, we predict it to take 0.635 minutes less for them to finish the online dissection. So as the IQ of a person goes up by one, we predict it to take 0.635 less minutes to complete the exam or the online dissection, excuse me. Now the R squared value we see here is actually pretty darn weak. It tells us that about 38.6% of the variation in times is actually explained by the variation in IQ. That's a pretty weak connection showing that they're not very strong. Now, remember, that's R squared. So what if we wanted to find R to, again, show how weak this relationship is? 
Well, if you have r squared and you want to find r, all you got to do is take the square root of it. It's pretty simple math. So the square root of 0.386 is an r value of 0.62. And an r value of 0.62 is fairly on the weaker side. And we like it to be, you know, 0.8 or higher to call it strong. So again, it is on the weaker side. But if you look at the data, we do see a lot of scatter in our data, even though it does have an overall negative linear form, it is still pretty spread out. But again, that just goes to show the fact that our, our linear regression model is not going to be very reliable because of how low the R squared value is. Finally, we have S and S tells us that, you know, hey, when we use this line to try to take an IQ and predict the time to complete the dissection, we're typically going to be off by 11 minutes. And when the values of the times range from, if you look at about 10 to 16 minutes is kind of the overall range of the times, if you're off by 11 minutes and the range is only 10 to 60, uh, that's kind of a lot. But that again makes sense because this data plot does have a lot of scatter to it. And if we were actually to fill in the line of regression, we would actually see that a lot of the residuals are pretty large, which means overall typical values are pretty far off from what we would predict. And that is why we're producing such a large S value. Now, again, that's not necessarily bad. It just means that our line is not going to be the most reliable line when we go ahead to use it. So hopefully this example makes sense and you're starting to understand how we could tie everything together. Don't forget that the other three columns, S, E, T value, P value, are not typically used until unit nine. So right now we're just going to ignore them. So what are some types of AP questions that could come out of this section that you need to be prepared for? Well, to be honest, kind of all of it, but they really like to focus on, can you interpret values? They love to give you those computer output tables and make sure that you know how to identify the y-intercept and interpret it, identify the slope and interpret it, talk about S, talk about R squared, know how S and R squared are truly focusing on how reliable your model is. They like to make sure that you know that a scatter plot should be somewhat linear if you're going to use correlation and that a residual plot should show no pattern indicating that a linear model is very appropriate for your data. So it's really more about the interpretation that they like to focus on, not so much in terms of all the teeny teeny tiny calculations. So please be prepared for all of that, just like we practiced in those last two examples.